White House. So tonight, the big dog will give a big sell. But also, let's be honest, an even bigger tease. Democrats, get ready to rock. Bubba's back in town. <laughs> the big dog's going to fall. Uh, Elvis is going to fall. Right here on the stage in Charlotte, North I'm Carolina. Back. Stevie Myers served as press secretary to Clinton White yeah, House and is a close personal friend. Steve Ready Smith was the senior strategist for the Fatal of the Cape campaign in 2008, not because of him. He's also an MSNBC political analyst. Okay. Well, Bill Clinton's already been out no. there talking tonight. Don't put we have it a clip yeah, don't put it on the news. Let's watch Bill Clinton this evening. It's online. We don't have it. Oh, Mary Ellis is telling me not to try. use it. God, God damn it. What was that? Why was it floating? Ask me to. God damn it. Who floated it? Why was it floating? It floated because Mary Alice said not to use it. Why not? I don't know. She was because telling me not to use it because she wasn't sure if it was the right fee. Well, I got to know that. How much time did it explain why I think his approach is wrong and it will pay off if we renew his contract. Explain why the economy he faced was much weaker and different than the one I faced. Nine, eight, So that there's no way any president, no president, could have restored it to full health. In just four years. Thank you. You know, TV, I love it. I love it. Bill Clinton, our former president, and your boss puts those big hands out there, those big hands, and he starts to explain. Tonight, is he going to explain the economic situation we face today and how Obama's going to get us out of it? He is, and that's what he said in, in that clip that you saw. I mean, one of the, the things that Bill Clinton, I think, brings to this above all else is that for 20 years he's been out there. Talking to middle class people, working class people about the reality of their lives. They know he isn't just talking in his election year. He's been talking the talk and walking the walk for a generation. So they know he gets it, they know he cares, and he's going to take that approachability, that accessibility, that ability to explain what's going on and why people should stick with the plan we're on. And he's going to bestow that upon Obama. And that's the greatest gift that he can give. He's going to give his 20 years of credibility with the middle class of this country. And he's gonna and he's gonna allow Obama uh, to rent it. Why don't we take a look now at the Bill Clinton TV ad for President right. Obama? This is the main pitch. We we'll hear some version of this tonight. Let's take a look at it. TV ad running in swing stuff. states right now. This election, to me, is about which candidate is more likely to return us to full employment. This is a clear choice. The Republican plan is to cut more taxes on upper income people and go back to deregulation. That's what got us in trouble in the first place. President Obama has a plan to rebuild America from the ground up, investing in innovation, education, and job training. It only works if there is a strong middle class. That's what happened when I was president. We need to keep going with his plan. Okay, let's go to Steve Strick. Steve, uh, it seems to me that I think, well, you, you're a political guy, and you're as smart as anybody in this business. I mean, you're really smart. Let me ask you, this. how did Bill Clinton come back from where he was in 88 after giving that clinker of a speech down in Georgia on behalf of Mike Dukakis to coming back now? He's at 69% in the National Gallery, a 30-point jump from where he was when he left office. He just keeps rising. We know his past. It seems irrelevant now. The problems he got into. How do he do it? This is Lazarus stuff. No, it's incredible. He was 42 years old in 1988. He went and delivered the keynote address. When he finished, he said, in conclusion, and the whole audience stood up and started cheering. And the next night, you saw his charm. I think it was on the Tonight Show. You know, where no, that's he right. Go laugh about that himself and you just realized that what a mess he was. And, you know, his longevity on the scene. You know, he was speaking tonight. If you love politics, you got to be excited about the speech tonight if you're a baseball fan. You know, it's like the opportunity to see someone like Mickey Mantle play. You know, it's just, it's going to be a great speech tonight from, as you said, the greatest politician of our era. Um, and also someone who's the most popular politician now in the United States. You know, somebody uh, who is endured, who's come back, when he's been knocked down, he's gotten back up. And people admire that. And they look back, I think, to the 90s. Even a lot of Republicans do with nostalgia. This was a time of peace and prosperity and good times. And tonight, I think you're going to see him in the role of explainer in chief, trying to explain the disconnect between the promise of four years ago and the reality. And there's no one more effective at it that the president could have asked to do this speech than, than he is. Oliver Wendell Holmes, I just came across this great quote. You can't control events around you. You can't control a lot in your life. But if you have a great heart, you have tremendous confidence in yourself. He could go through unbelievable stuff. Bill Clinton's going through, let's face it, impeachment. He's going through Monica. He's going through Barbara Rich and all that junk. 
30 <laughs> points higher because he came back Jesus. and did the Clinton Global Initiative. Hey, exactly. By the way, everybody in here, documentary, President of the world. I'll be doing a web this chat, so you take the Norway, starting really in the next break, the so don't say anything you don't want anyone to hear. This is, I mean, that goes triple for you. Speeches with you with the press problems. Well, he never stops, you know, he, he, he never stops thinking about the world. Uh, so he, he, he really is um, a congenital optimist, is something he's called himself. He really does believe that it matters, that policy matters. He really believes that if you get up every day and you work really hard and you put your shoulder to the wheel, that you can make life better for people. And people have seen that commitment year after year after year after year when he didn't have to do it, when he could have been out playing golf, and instead he's traveling around the world trying to communicate how we can create an economy that serves all people. But how does his people mind work? Him now. This is what I don't know and you might know. In the midst of his travails back in 98, when all the stuff was in the fan, he walked out on the stage of the U.S. Congress in the chamber of the United States House and gave an amazing barn-burning State of the Union address. His mind was totally on the big stuff. Right, right. How did he do that? How did he clear his head? Well, I suppose that's that'll be that's a question for the ages, right? It's compartmentalization or whatever, or focus. His ability to focus on the things that he cares about, the things that he can control, and the things that he thinks make everyone. the difference. It's what gets him out of bed excited every day. Well, one of the things that struck me when I first met him was his ability to bring people to his ideas and get them excited about the possibility. And I think we'll see that in a minute tonight. That it's still possible. I mean, he still is the man from hope. He can still bring people in, get them excited, get them fired up, and send them out to do the work. Spinny, let me ask you about the politics. It seems to me if these two guys get together, as, as Secretary Clinton and President Clinton have been at least formally, the Democratic Party's united. If he can get the white non-college people from southwestern Pennsylvania, if he can get the people in Virginia who are maybe a bit conservative for Democrats, if he can bring them in, and with the liberals and the mainstream Democrats, it's all about Pennsylvania. Do you think Clinton can bring them in, the people that are holding up right now on the president? I, I, I think he's going to make a powerful endorsement tonight. It's going to be a great speech. But at the end of the day, I always think that the power of endorsements in campaigns, with very, very rare exceptions, are overstated. The election, at the end of the day, is going to be between the president and Governor Romney, and we'll have the three debates between those two, and that's going to be, in my view, the determinative, the determination, you know, the, the determinative factor in the in the race. Okay, let's cut to the quick. It's a week before the election. These guys are 47, 47. Right now, they're about 47, 47. You got to get Western Pennsylvania. You're losing Ding. Pennsylvania. It's too close to call. Would you bring him in and travel around in an open car? Would you have Bill Clinton standing next to you, or would you feel you have to you? What would you do, Steve? Well, I'd plant him in Pennsylvania, uh, you know, Southern Ohio, um, you know, any any of those states that obviously, you know, Bill Clinton had, you know, a a great ability as a Democrat to appeal to those white working class voters that you know are an important part of the swing. You know, vote in the election, including also suburban women, uh, where I think he has the ability to be very, very effective. But no. I agree with Steve that endorsements have a very short half life. But what Bill Clinton, I think, is going to do tonight is make an argument. And I think that argument could really resonate um, with the president, with the surrogates that are going on around the country, with the acts, with the whole package. Tying it together and making that argument that appeals to middle class and working class. By the way, you know Al Gore, right? Yes. You think Al Gore wished he had used Bill Clinton in 2000 in places like Tennessee, Arkansas, New Hampshire, states he could have won, even Florida? You know, I mean, I think when you lose, when you win the election and somehow manage to lose it, Right? There's plenty of time for second-guessing what you could have done differently. I mean, he did get more votes. Um, he could have used a few more. So I think he's probably run those things over in his mind. It, you know, it's all Monday morning. Let's talk about the future then. Not Monday morning, next, uh, well, 2016. Yeah. Hillary Clinton's gotten great marks for being Secretary of State, has done nothing wrong, has gotten nothing but credit for what she's done, has been a good team player and a leader worldwide, and one of the great worldwide leaders right now. What do you think Bill Clinton would like her to do? I honestly think he wants her to take some time off. I think he knows how tired she is, how hard she's worked, what a great job she's done. She wants, he, I think he wants to bring her to the foundation for now, where she can focus on women and girls, something she's passionate about. You see her talk about it. She lights up the room in the world. Um, and then if she should decide to take her also a high 60% approval rating out for a spin and run for president, again, I think it would be 100%. How many people here would like to see Hillary run for president? Thank you. Um, yeah. 
He believes that when you work hard and done well and, and walk through that doorway of opportunity, you do not slam it shut behind you. It wasn't the only striking difference between the two conventions. We'll get into it in just a moment. Plus, Ted Kennedy sadly wasn't here last night, but his spirit was certainly felt. Two of his children, Patrick and Ted Jr., are going to be right here in a couple minutes. Also, Bill Clinton will surely light up the hall tonight. Who better to turn on the insight than the big man himself? Who but the actor who studied him, played him, parodied him for 15 years on Saturday Night Live? Daryl Hammond, who inherits the soul of Bill Clinton. And finally, let me finish tonight with the bark of the big dog. You're going to hear it tonight. This is hard off. Play some politics. Woo! Yeah, just be careful on that. We don't even have a buster. All right. We all excited about hardball here? Yeah. All right. The man on the screen there is John Reese. He's the executive producer of Hardball with Chris Matthews. John, can you hear us okay? I can hear you fine. Hello, Charlotte. Say hello to John Reese. <laughs> John, how's it going so far? So far, so good. You can see Chris is, Chris is an empresario. This is, this is the thing he loves most. He loves doing the show. He loves crowds. He's got both right now. He's a very happy guy. I think we have a few thousand outside watching the show live and a few hundred in here uh, watching you live. I, think huh. I don't know how much time. We probably have about a minute. You want to take some questions from the, from the group here? Sure, sure. In fact, we have a little bit more than a minute because we're not going to do that cluster we talked about. So. Oh, good. All right. Well, then we've got a couple minutes. So if you want to come over and ask a question. Just tell us what your name is. Hi, my name is Joseph Brown. And my question is, how do you choose people for the show, uh, such as the average Joe, like me, who would give you an average opinion of the average person on the street who is living the average life, not rich, not poor, just average? Um, I, I've, I've got to be candid. We have very few guests like uh, an average Joe. Uh, generally, the, the people we have on the show are political newsmakers and journalists. Uh, and you actually have to make a very good point. It's, it's something we rarely do. We have done it at times, and every time we do it, honestly, we say, you know what, we should do more of that. So I, I thank you for the reminder because that's a very good idea. We don't do that very much. Thank you. Thank you. And it's always my favorite part of the show when Chris takes the microphone out to the crowd. So I think he's probably going to see some average Joes today. <laughs> do we have, oh, yeah. we have time for one more? Oh, sure. And that, by the way, that's Chris's favorite part of the show, too. That's right. <laughs> Hello, my name is Husnia and I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, I just had a question. How do you select or choose the topics for each show? Uh, that is a, uh, an excellent question. We spend a lot of time in the morning um, reading the various newspapers, blogs, um, and uh, watching shows like Morning Joe on MSNBC um, and try to decide not what is the biggest story necessarily, but what's the most compelling story? What's the story that people the next day are going to want to talk about so that they say, as Chris often says, hey, did you see Hardball last night? Did you hear what they said? Did you see what Chris said? That there's some kind of takeaway that you would not get someplace else. That's sort of the fun of it. Anybody, it's easy enough to do a show that says, okay, here are the four biggest stories of the day and we can do them. But what we really want to do is get opinion and be provocative, both with our guests and of course, with Chris, who's as provocative as it gets. All right. I, I think we, I heard a 30-second cue behind yep. you there. We're almost there. Okay. So why don't we uh, let you get back to the show. We're going to watch uh, the next segment, and we'll get back with you. Okay. Happy to do it. Thank you, John. Welcome back to Harbaugh. Last night, the Democrats were fired up at the start of their convention here in yeah, Charlotte. The whole field was slightly different, I can tell you, from last week's Republicans' business meeting down in Tampa. San Antonio Mayor Joey Julian Castro gave the keynote in which he praised President Obama's record and also went on the attack against Romney. Let's take a listen. Mitt Romney, quite simply, doesn't get it. 
a few so months ago. He visited a university in Ohio and gave students Michael, there the a little entrepreneurial advice. Start a business, he it's said. In, it's in the, the access but how? Oh, yeah. Borrow money if you have to it's from your there. parents, there. he told him. It's, Gee, not going, it's not going through. What is he I don't think I'm going to get out of the farm. Seven. I think he's a good guy. Yes. He just Cut out the no laughter. idea how good he's had it. Unlike the speakers that. in the crowd out there uh, right here, I actually seem to like the candidate. Here was Matthew's governor to Mount, but I didn't know he had it. In. This is one of the most effective no. circuits I've ever heard. They got to keep this guy in the trail. Here he is, Governor DeVal Patrick of Massachusetts, defending President Obama's record. You're going to watch that why. It's time for Democrats to grow a backbone and stand up for what we believe. This is the president who delivered the security of affordable health care to every single American in every corner of this country after 90 years of trying. This is the president who brought well, Osama bin Laden to justice, our, who ended the, the war in Iraq and is ending the war in Afghanistan. This is the president yeah. who ended yeah. Don't Ask, Don't Tell, yeah. so that love yeah. of country, yeah. not love of another, determines yeah. fitness for service, yeah. who made yeah. equal pay yeah. for equal work, the law of the land. <laughs> anyway, last night, yeah. there yeah. 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 are some yeah. major differences yeah. between the parties. We're going to get into them right now with yeah. Diane Edwards, U.S. Congresswoman from Thank you so much. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let me just say, well, I'm you're on the cover up. I was too. Everybody who wants to go into politics should read the Val Patrick's speech. Recite it a million times and say, is this what I want to do for a living? Yeah, that's of course, what the accent's is. not translating so, to air. Getting out there and saying, this is what we stand for, this is what we've done. We're better than the other guy. Got it? He was fantastic. Well, and Chris, not apologizing for it. And so he put the record out there because so much of what we heard during the Republican convention was just a bunch of nonsense and it wasn't true. What Governor Deval Patrick did last night is he said, let's talk about what the real record is. And Democrats, we're proud of what we've done. We're not, we've done. We're not going to walk away from it. Yeah, Chris, that was the most powerful thing. I didn't give the reaction to the crowd just a moment ago. Standing up with strength of character, principle, having the courage of your convictions resonates. People want strength, and they don't want people to necessarily apologize for their points of view. So I, I agree with you 100%. By the way, it does not surprise me because he's effective all the time. They're all been amazing. Oh, I know, but I never saw him do that street corner oratory like that last night. Oh, like, that was out with a bullhorn. Well, I loved well, you it. You know what we saw? We saw so many people in the Republican convention, what they were doing, they were selling themselves. They weren't Did selling you notice? Oh. Everybody gave a 90% of their speech to themselves. Yeah. That's right. Now, that big guy from Jersey, what's his name, Chrissy? Thirty. All he talked about was Chrissy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, big guy. Yeah, my turn to I love the fact that your governor's challenged him to a, to a uh, push-up contest. Guy? Guy? Really uh, anyway, as NBC's that first read blog yeah. pointed out this morning, that. there was a big difference between mm -hmm. how the two conventions talked about the American dream. The message last week was focused on an American dream to become an entrepreneur, a businessman. But speakers last night, like Michelle Obama, the first lady, had a very different take. Let's watch. Barack knows the American dream because he's lived it. And he wants everyone in this country, everyone, to have the same opportunity, no matter who we are, or where we're from, or what we look like, or who we love. And he believes that when he works hard, he does well. And, and walk through that doorway of opportunity. You do not slam it shut behind you. No, you reach back and you give other folks the same chances to help you succeed. Well, the keynote holding on construct and Antonio tied the American dream to the immigrant experience and the role government plays in providing opportunity. Let's watch him. The American dream is not a sprint or even a marathon. Amen. Our families don't always cross the finish line in the span of one generation. But each generation passes on to the next the fruits of their labor. Like, you know, you know what he's My grandmother to? never owned a house. You. I don't know why it's not working. She cleaned okay. other people's houses so she could afford to rent her own. She saw her daughter become the first in her family to graduate from college. And my mother fought hard for civil rights so that instead of a mop, I could hold this microphone. 
Can I ask what I thought? I said it last night, I keep saying because I learned something last night. So much of us, so many of us whose families came, mine came over a couple of generations from Ireland and the British Isles, and, and to us, that was the immigrant experience. I think he made the point, the mayor did last night, that the immigrant experience coming south to north is the same thing. It may come from, and to, it's to get work, it's to find an opportunity. I thought he really did that incredibly well. Well, I think between Mayor Castro and the First Lady, what you heard is a dream that every parent and grandparent shares for their children. And I think they laid that out there in a way that says that we're connected as communities and as human beings, and that our experiences may be slightly different, but they're not all that different. Did you get, were you struck by the fact that it's not just black people, but brown people, by Hispanic people? Who were affected very directly by the Civil oh, Rights Act. The, he, was, those people were discriminated against as well. Absolutely. And then what you could hear from that is the connectedness between all of our experiences. And what he said is, as a brown person, and what she said is, as a as a black person. Guess what? We've shared some stuff. Yeah. And you could hear it. It was a great it was thing. Yeah. 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 This is evocative of the best. Yeah, of, and by the way, yeah. a lot of kudos to you for your work for St. for climate equality last night. I think every speaker. Every speaker, including the first lady, made a big case for marriage equality. No, oh, I appreciate it. Thank you. And, and back to the point when you stand on principle, when you have the courage of your convictions, and and that was what I see with Governor. Spudder. But it was a point. I think those two speeches connected me to the best of Dr. King. So we're all bound together by web of mutuality. We're all in this together. That notion of commonwealth was alive. And well last night. Uh, that's right. One thing missing from both Governor Romney's yeah, and Congressman Paul Ryan's speeches last week was any mention of the war the country's yeah, actually yeah, fighting now. Yeah. And that's something Tammy Duckworth, a war hero herself, brought up last night. When it comes to our men and women in harm's way, we have a clear choice on November 6th. Last week, Mitt Romney had a chance to show uh, his support for the brave like men and women he's it. seeking to command. But he chose to criticize President Obama instead of even uttering the word Afghanistan. Barack Obama will never ignore our troops. He will fight for them. Governor, why do the neocons, the hawks, always want to talk about fresh wars yeah. and never talk about the wars we're still fighting with all the, the horror that comes with them? For obvious point, they're messy, they're complicated. It's easy to start something, it's difficult to follow through. And you know, the irony of this, they get us in both these wars, and it's President Obama that's been cleaning up this mess, and it's this convention, and the conventioners that are doing everything that needs to be done to get us out of these wars in a safe and responsible way. One part of the library. <laughs> No mention. You know, I come from a military family, and so when I see what President Obama has done, and particularly the First Lady with our military family, families and our servicemen and women, we can't ignore them. And so, you know, to talk about starting new wars, but not even mention the honorable service that's going on right now, the kind of sacrifice that's going on in this country. No one should be president. I think, I know, why. I, think I know why they didn't do it, because they're trying to sell a new one. Anyway, one thing was clear last night, the Democrats decided they, they weren't going to run away from Obamacare anymore. In fact, they call it Obamacare. Kathleen Sebelius, the Secretary of Health and Education, Health and Human Service, that was the old name, said Democrats should wear the nickname Obamacare like a badge of honor. And one of the most emotional speeches of the night came from Stacey Lynch, the mother of a child with heart problems, who had some strong words on the law. Let's watch her. General Whitehack, why? If Mitt Romney becomes president and Obamacare is repealed, there's a good chance she'll hit her lifetime cap. There's no way we can afford to pay for all the care she needs to survive. When you have a sick child, it's always in the back of your mind and sometimes in the front of your mind. On top of that, worrying that people would let an insurance company take away her health care just because of politics? One in 100 children are born with a congenital heart defect. President Obama is fighting for them. Thanks, Roman. Uh, I loved it because the Republican ad campaign has been trying to suggest that Obamacare is some plan to skim from middle class retirees in Medicare and give it to poor people. We have a person's problem. It's called Medicare. This is different. This is called insurance for people who have real high health prices. It is, Chris, and it's an anchor. It's what middle class families need 
It's what Stacey Lynn said that she needed for her family, and the Republicans want to take that away. They only got one shot. It's called November. Anyway, thank you very much, you as Congressman <laughs> Don Andrews, who I've always supported. Anyway, Gavin Newsom, Lieutenant Governor of California, up there, export from Charlotte, and our coverage of the Democratic National Convention down here. This is hardball. Oh, thank you. I have seen firsthand that being president doesn't change who you are. No, it, it reveals who you are. I've seen that the issues that come across the president's desk are always the hard ones. You know, the problems where no amount of data or numbers will get you to. I've seen how the issues that come across the president's desk are always the hard ones. You said we went right to the video. No amount of data or numbers will get you to the right Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Move over. Move in just a bit. There you go. <laughs> hi, Dennis. All right. Hi, John. How are you? Uh, we're good. We're almost halfway through. Not going smoothly. Glitch. We had one glitch at the top, but that's, you know what? That's live TV. Par for the course. Well, we have a bunch of people that want to talk to you, so I'm just going to get right to questions, okay? Hi, John. I'm Gerilyn Roberts, and I'm from Hanover, Maryland. My question to you is, how do you and who does the research to fact check, fact check the information that's shared on the show, and what's the turnaround for getting it done? Well, we have uh, a very small staff um, for a show that's on every night uh, and incredibly hardworking. We have uh, what I call our, our, our two-state solution. We have half uh, our staff is in New York, half the staff is in Washington, where Chris is, and um, the segment producers are the ones uh, really who do all the research. Um, and they work from about 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning until we go on the air live at 5. Um, we have a story meeting at about 3.30 where Chris really asks the producers very, very tough questions about their stories, about whether they know what they're talking about, uh, so obviously, Chris, in most cases, knows way more than we ever would about these segments. And then, additionally, while the show is on the air, if we catch somebody saying something that's not true, uh, again, those producers try to try to find out what the truth is so that Chris can correct it on the air. Not an easy thing to do, but we get to do it. And I think the part that cut out, you were saying half of the staff is in New York, the other half is in Washington, D.C. With, with Chris. Right, and that and that's where the the segment producers, the people who actually. We even try uh, when somebody says something that's not true on the air to to get the information to Chris and correct it on the air that night, so that anybody who's watching that night uh, knows that somebody has has said something that isn't true. All right. Yeah. So John here, executive producing the show from a from a different city. While well, while he's in New York and Chris is in Charlotte, that's how he does the show every single day with with Chris in Washington. They're rarely in the same building, right? Right. It's a rare treat when Chris is up here or I'm down there. We love it when he comes up here. Right. All right. Sounds, I think we're running out of time in this break. I think we are. How much time back? Thirty seconds. Yeah, we got thirty seconds. Thirty seconds. All right. We'll, we'll, let's go to the go back to the show and we'll catch up with you in the next one. You got it. Beautiful. Thank you. Eighty silver, seven, six, six, five, four, three, two, two, one. You hear me, Silver Track? Start your Here we are. Here we are. It's time again. We're going to hit some of these people. And I just want to hear what they're thinking and feeling right now. I'm like, no question, ma'am. What do you think it'd feel? I'd like to make sure that the president is reelected. That's what I'm thinking about. And taking my energy back to Florida. Okay, good work. You'll need it down there. It's I'm feeling very excited. The Democratic Convention is representative of America, and it was representative of the values that the Democratic Party holds. From oh, Congressional oh, Georgia's 8th Congressional District, Warner Robbins in Perry, Georgia. <laughs> Oh, I'm, right. I'm from South Carolina. I'm feeling very good, very optimistic about President Obama re-election, and we're very excited in South Carolina. So I'm really excited to vote for President Obama for four more years because he's earned my vote. Oh, he's in North Carolina. Judy Mitchell from Columbia, South Carolina, and I'm excited to be here. I'm from South Carolina. I'm here for Obama. Okay, say something else. Well, you should have asked him to say something else. You are one of six percent of American people. What will it decide for you? The debates? What are you going to make up your mind? When you're in the booth, 
on the way in the book or during the debates? I made up my mind. She didn't say she was undecided. I'm going to bomb because I trust him. I'm, I'm concerned about the future of our country for my daughter and her family, and my son and his wife, and our granddaughter. And we just uh, you know, cannot go back. Right? And that's what the Republicans are pushing. I got to ask this guy, the Carolina sweatshirt, what do you think? Uh, we're from Atlanta, representing as well. Uh, we're glad to be here. Look at that sweatshirt, the School of Journalism. Uh, you know how many Chapel Hill. came out of Chapel Hill? Chapel Hill. That's right. My daughter, my daughter, and my wife included. Thomas Wolf went there. All these amazing writers. I went there. Fort Myers, Florida. We are here because we're going to do our part to support the music. Okay, great. We got to wrap right now. I got the instructions. We'll be right back. All right. Hey, Dennis, you got your average Joe's. You got a treat. You got the the Chris Matthews. Ah. <laughs> yes. well, I got the, uh, we have a question here in the room, John. Hi, John. Cindy Stern. My question is, does Chris do most of his writing, or how does that all work? Uh, he does a lot of the writing. The, the first thing you hear on the show, uh, the Let Me Start, uh, he does. He writes all by himself. He goes over the, the sideshow uh, so that it really has his, uh, you know, his voice in it, and then the Let Me Finish is all Chris's as well. And everything else... The first draft is written by one of us, uh, by the, the uh, segment producers, but Chris goes through every page uh, and makes it sound like him. So he's, if, if all goes well, Chris will have seen every page and have written many of them, especially the tough ones. All right. And there's a lot less writing on Hardball than, uh, than a lot of shows. Yes, there is. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kathy O'Connell from Virginia, and I'm just really curious. Um, have you ever had a particular guest that you really, really wanted to have on who absolutely refused? Oh, yeah, Al Franken. Um, the moment he got elected, we wanted to get Al Franken on the air um, because we knew he'd be a spectacular guest. Uh, not only is he a senator, but obviously a charming and funny guy. But uh, he has followed the Hillary Clinton role, um, which is keep your head down, only do local TV, only do local radio. Uh, don't make a spectacle, and that's the way to get respected in the Senate and to get reelected. So if we can get him on, we're okay, hoping to get him tonight, you. frankly, not on hardball, but um, uh, on the convention floor. Um, my guess is he's going to say no for the for the reasons I mentioned, but he's the guy I'd love, I'd most like to have. A more dangerous question would be, how many guests have you had that wouldn't come back? <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you see the Republican convention? Yes, I did. <laughs> Uh, there are that, that has happened. In some cases, they didn't want to come back. In some cases, we were happy not to not to invite them back. Do we have time? Do we have time for one more? Or are you? Yeah, we, do. we do. Okay, here we go. Hey, John, how you doing? I'm Robert from Virginia. Hi, Robert from Virginia. Speaking of guests, was there ever a guest that you had in which you said, "Boy, this was a mistake"? Oh, yeah, I don't want to mention... Well, I don't it. want you to mention his name. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we we had... It's happened a few times. Uh, uh, you know, anybody who's worked in TV knows that sometimes you have guests who are magnificent on the phone, and then they're a disaster on the air. The moment the camera comes on, they freeze. And we had a couple of office holders, too, who really did not want to have a conversation. What they wanted to do was fight and tell Chris how stupid he was. Um, so we've had, we've had regrets. We've had a few. Seven, All right, we're down to five six, seconds, Dennis. Okay, five, we'll see you next time. Got it. Thank you. I'm convinced. And Julia Forrest in the Virginia market. The Dow gains more than half points. The S&P is off by one and a half points. That's a measly five points. FedEx shares slipped 2% after the company cut its first quarter forecast, blaming the weak global economy. Facebook rose nearly 5% after CEO Mark Zuckerberg said he has no plans to sell shares for at least a year. And applications for homeowners fell last week, according to the Morgan Bankers Association. That's it from CNBC First and Business Worldwide. Now back to Hardball.
The best way to find out about what a party will do is what it has done. Uh, we were the ones that brought higher education, the Medicare programs, the Medicaid uh, programs, knocked down the walls of discrimination. We brought a sound uh, economy, a sensible foreign policy. Those are the, the essential That's values correct. of the Democratic Party, aren't they? I believe in the party guy out. of hope and possibility. I always have, even in the darkest hours. Yeah, yeah. So I sure know what so America can achieve. I've seen it. I've lived it. Yes. it. And we're with Barack Obama. We can do it All right. again. Four, ready to trigger our screen. Two, one, a fact. Well, I've never been more proud of my that, father that than right? I was this, this, in the yeah, hall last right? night because, that's you know, that's he that's was a guy right? who every four that's years that's came that's to the Democratic that's Convention. That's that's reminded us all why we were Democrats and reaffirmed why why he was in public service. You know, there wasn't a guy who worked harder, who was more committed to fairness to the underdog, and he would come here every four years and get recharged by all of his friends across the country. Uh, Patrick, my friend, you know, uh, it seems like everybody, forget the big picture, Ted Kennedy, the big great legislator, and I said last night, that uh, your Uncle Jack could have picked him as one of the greatest senators in history if he had been able to look forward back in the 50s. Uh, his personal thing he would do for people, the phone calls. Talk about that, because you were the son, yeah, and you must have wanted, how does this guy have so much time to make all these phone calls to people? I'm gonna well, make trouble. Here, Teddy and I have been trying to make it through lobbies in this convention no, town, and there isn't a place where we go where people and, uh, don't stop us and tell us about what our father meant to them in their personal lives. Yeah, yeah. And last night, Michelle Obama talked about how all politics is personal. My dad understood that. My brother Teddy, when he faced a life-threatening illness and lost his life to cancer, said it's not enough to provide health care if it doesn't save people from being bankrupted because of health care costs. So, you know, that's why my dad fought for health care, just like last night, Michelle Obama talking about her father with MS. That's why this president needs to be reelected because he represents what average American families are facing on a daily basis. I was wondering uh, why health care, and I thought back having studied your family a bit, uh, your Uncle Jack the President had a terrible back prop his whole life, and he had stomach problems his whole life. And your dad, of course, had a, had a plane accident, almost was killed in his back. You could see the brace. I mean, you know, it was the pain he was in. Is it big, and it's Rosemary, of course, your aunt, who had the, the mental problems. And is this what your family has been so devoted to help you? the point. Special living. Is this personal experience? And then there's the one who crashed. I think that... Who crashed from out the, the one the lobotomy. We get one the lobotomy. And then don't empathy. forget your aunt. Just Joe. like this president does. He, he... I think it was, you know, having a sister with an intellectual disability sensitized him to the vulnerability in all human beings right. and that's the exactly the the way that the reason that's why this right. president is going to be reelected is because he has the same sensibility he can connect with people in a very intimate and authentic way and that's what's ultimately going to decide this race caroline your cousin's going to speak tomorrow night at the convention hall everybody's going to watch that uh, it was a wonderful story about generations and this is very much a, an american story where the kids, oh, and my, oh, my glasses. kids in their 20s, oh, yeah. went to their parents and said, you know, this new guy on the block, Obama, may have a strange name for most of you, but this is the future. we got to go with him. Was that true in your families? The younger people tended to be more out to break out. Am I reading the question? Or, uh, no. Uh, no. Uh, Dennis Van Pond just had great affection for Hillary Reagan, President Clinton. Recognize the historic moment in this country 
50 years after his brother was the first president to speak about the moral issue of civil rights. My father was the one to stand in that arc of history, Chris, that you talk about, and be there for the first African-American president elected in this country's history. No, uh, in my family, my son Michael said something I never thought of before, despite noticing your family, what it's done. Jack Kennedy, President Kennedy, took a segregationist party and turned it into a civil rights party and won the presidency. Well, it wasn't hard to do. I mean, it wasn't easy to do, as you know. Um, but you're right. And I think the reason why my uncles and my father... They were all incredible individuals, but the reason why we're still talking about President uh, Kennedy glad the and Robert F. Kennedy, and why we're still going to be talking in, about Barack Obama years from now, is because what they stood for, not just who they were. Let me ask you about uh, being a son of Ted Kennedy, which is most of us out here unimaginable. And I'm one of the unimaginables, because I can't imagine what it's like to have a, a, my father's faith, but to be an historic figure like Ted Kennedy and have had so much impact on people personally and collectively. What, did you, what do you feel when you hear him talked about in the, in the past tense by people who never knew him personally? Well, you know, I, have, I love my father so much. I, I, he was my hero. I had tremendous amount of respect, even every passing day, understanding and learning more and more about the multitude of issues that he was involved with. He was able to balance his public life and his dedication to his family. And, and remember, Chris, it wasn't, he was not just a father to me and my brother and my late sister. He was a father to all of us in our family, and that was quite quite a responsibility. Um, and he took that very very seriously. And he was loved by everybody in my family who was, who called him Uncle Teddy. So um, you know, I always wondered how I would feel after my father died when people would come up to me, as Patrick said, in the hallways and talk about a story. I didn't know whether I would be wistful or it would bring on melancholy, etc. But you know what? I, I love hearing these stories about how the ways in which my father, you know, helped individual people. And um, and that's that's something that I feel an enormous amount of pride about. How do you feel when you hear it? Because the rest of your life you're going to hear it. Well, I had the great honor of serving with my father in addition to calling hey, dad. Of Congress, I was a colleague of his. And we both you both pretty much the same way. I thought we did. And we spoke to the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act just before the health care bill. This was the health I care told you. I told you. What do you want me to do? Last you know, Chris, I am speaking it's up. It's a civil rights issue to make sure people with mental illnesses and addictions do get segregated, really, from the health care system because we don't treat mental health as hope overall health. Hey, great. Keep working that. You will. Keep working. Thank Patrick, you. thank you. Ted, Ted, thank you. Up next, no one's studying Bill Clinton more than the man who played him so famously. So great nights on Saturday Night Live. The great, incredible Daryl Hammond's coming here. This is hardcore. Let's pop it. Three, two, one, trigger. No way. Love it. All right, John, how are we doing? We're doing great. This this show is it's smooth. It's so smooth I can talk to you at every break with no problem. Don't jinx it. There's ten minutes left. Is this our last break? Can you be here for every show? Yes, we've been here. <laughs> All right, I think uh, this is our last break, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, there's actually, there's one more one break. One more after this. Okay, so let's uh, do a couple more questions. Sure. Hey, how's it going? Uh, I'm Trevor from uh, Hawaii, sir. Um, yeah, I, I just have a question. Like, um, I've been trying to catch up on that show, uh, The Newsroom. Um, I was just wondering if you watch it or, or in, uh, uh, if you have a comment on it, and also like how similar uh, the process is that they go by and you know the communication uh, and, and really the interaction that they, that they go through in the show. Yeah, well, we're much more quick-witted and, and smarter than they are. Uh, uh, you know, we're, we're a lot smarter than Aaron Sorkin. Um, a lot of it is, is real, and obviously some of it is, is a, a Hollywood version of, of what we do. I mean, they, if you watch the show, um, they face the same questions we do. Uh, the difference is that about six people on their show seem to answer all the questions for the entire network. Um, but uh, some of, some of, some of it, it's good. And frankly, I, I haven't seen every episode. I've seen about three or four of them. Uh, and I love Aaron Sorkin, so I, I really enjoyed it. And you, you don't, uh, whoop, hello, okay, one more Hi. question. Hi, John. Uh, my name is Shana Barnes from Boston, Massachusetts. Hi. Um, hi. Sorry um, about the Red Sox. I'm sorry? Oh, the, sorry oh yeah, I heard. Oh, 
Thanks. Um, my question is, what if I have a topic that I want Chris uh, and the team to investigate? How would I get that to you? Um, and, and would you look into that, or would that be something that would be a topic on the show? Yeah, uh, I can't guarantee it, but I mean, there are a number of ways to do it. One is the Hardball blog. Uh, the other is facebook.com slash hardball. And you're actually in a great position. There's a woman right near you. I don't know exactly where she is, named Ann Clank. Uh, and she is uh, our senior producer and uh, runs the booking department. And you should walk over, find her, and get her card. Uh, and she will be happy to talk to you about uh, stories um, that um, you suggest. And you can email her as well. I'm guessing Ann Clank is probably out somewhere among those thousand people around the live show right now. I, I think that's right. Um, <laughs> but she, she'd be more than happy to talk about it, quite seriously. So Chris, just speak of all the social media stuff, Chris has just picked up Twitter and Facebook and stuff this year. How's that been going for him? Actually, I think it's going pretty well. You know, the, the previous question was, was about uh, the newsroom. And there was, a, in the very first episode, um, the, the, Jeff Daniels says at one point, I have a blog? And I thought, all right, that's Chris Matthews. Um, that came right, came, came right from Chris. Yeah, I think he had a blog long before you knew it. Okay, I'm just told we have 30 seconds, so we'll hold the question until the next break. Um, you got it. All right, thanks, John. We'll See you. 15 seconds. You can pump, Jeff. 10. Stand by, still there. 9 seconds. 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Triggers over track. Stand by, start moving, Jeff. Good. Yeah, Daryl, you're single on our screen. Next to the next chance for me. You're single on Daryl. 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 Dary
right now for him. What is he like? He, no, looks, he seems like he's at his best. Like when when do we have problems? Something really bad happens. He comes along. The, 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 the big brother. The bedside vigil. Yeah, yeah. the big brother. <clears throat> yeah, well, and he's at his best, man. He's one of the most selfless performers I've ever seen. I think he's going to try to make the president look really good. He's very he's tactical and strategic in the way he speaks, too. I mean, I think he realizes the, the big picture of, of tonight, what his job is, and I think he'll, yeah, I think he'll do it. He's, 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 he's a very optimistic and guy, isn't he? I, mean, I think the guy never, never, never went yeah, to a bad day without thinking that tomorrow was going to be a better day. I don't think he is. I, I've always, often wondered if he, if he even understands negativity on a basic level. Yeah, I, I don't uh, think it can be. Here he is, here you are, Darren, uh -huh. playing Bill Clinton on Saturday Night Live uh, after uh, George W. Bush's inauguration. Let's watch. Good evening, my fellow Americans. Tonight I'm coming to you as Citizen Bill Clinton. As you know, earlier today, George W. Bush was sworn into office, and now he is your president for a majority of us. That's a Stand by, Jeff. He's coming to come in. There's somebody else whose voice you did pretty well, actually. Oh, gosh. Madam Secretary, the administration has chastised Newsweek for printing a story which relied on faulty information. Now you claim you're investigating the Saddam Hussein cheesecake photos. I ask you, is the administration losing control faster than Billy Joel Four, behind the wheel three, after a 10 martini two. lunch? <laughs> <laughs> Doing what? Are you starting a war? <laughs> How about the misery of ending a war? Uh, no, I'm not. No, no, no. Okay, no. Uh, uh, what are you doing out there? You can change. Give us a bill. Give us a bill. What? He's got two more minutes. I can hardly lose. Give us a preview tonight. What's happening? What he would do? Yeah. He would say, uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with the TV or is it under the TV? He thinks about what is right with America. I swear to God. 90 seconds, yes. I'm curious as to whether Donald Trump is watching this at home. Oh, you think? Trump is here. He's dying to be here. Yeah. What is it about Trump and the hair? Did you figure it out? I think not out. We used to call it the onion loaf. We're trying to figure out where it is. And it didn't seem to bother him at all. The onion loaf? Yeah, it's like, my hair's an onion loaf. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only world. <laughs> you say huge the way he says it. You. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> one one minute. Yes. Okay, that's enough time. It's coming back at midnight. We're going to be here having a lot of fun after everything. You're going to do Bill Clinton tonight after Bill Clinton. Eugene Robinson, Greg Sports. We'll return. Let me thank you for looking at Bill Clinton taking his stage. You got to stick a promo in there? Yeah. You want all right, John, you with us? I'm with you. All right, it's our final segment here. I'm just going to get to questions that we couldn't get to. Here we go. Hi, John. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, is it hard to book certain Republicans that don't show up for the show? And yes. Who booked them? Is there a list of questions they won't answer? Uh, I'll take the second question first. Um, we don't give people questions. Anybody who says well, I'm not going to ask uh, answer a question on X, Y, or Z, we just don't book. Um, Republicans are difficult for us to book because generally uh, they want to go with the home team, and that's Fox. Um, they know they're going to have an easier time there, I think, and I think sometimes wrongly they think that we won't be fair to them. Um, so they tend not to come here. So some of them are very difficult, although we're very happy when we get Republicans to come on. Great, thank you. Come on, we have another one. I think we have two and a half minutes. All right. There you go. 
Hello, I am a huge, huge fan. Watching at six in the morning, I particularly like Mika oh, I, Brzezinski. I can't hear you. Can you I, the... I'm a huge fan, and I love watching, particularly uh, Mika Brzezinski. My question is, what was the most memorable event that occurred during the shows that were produced? You mean uh, on Hardball? Yeah, yeah, on Hardball. Yes, Hardball. Uh, yeah, because yeah. uh, uh, Mika's on Morning Joe. Court, what's the most memorable thing we ever did? <laughs> The question was, what's the most memorable show we ever produced? You know what? I think it was when we had, uh, we, we used to do uh, what we call college tours, and we had candidate uh, Barack Obama, the senator, uh, four years ago uh, in Pennsylvania, and there was really nothing like that. The, the, the crowd enthusiasm was like what you see out there, um, but it was all so incredibly fresh. Um, and about three times as many people as usual uh, watched us that night. It was a, that was really a spectacular night. Also, when we had um, John McCain, similar reaction. Uh, my question is: with dealing with issues as complex as health care reform, how do you decide what you're going to present to the audience? Considering the fact that you have such a huge responsibility, and this is such a complex issue. I'm very curious about how you determine how what you te tell people. Yeah, well, you know what, you, you've actually, that, that's the toughest question to answer. Or I guess that's the toughest challenge for us because you're right, it's very complicated, and TV is not complicated friendly. So we have to work very hard to try to make the stories understandable and always stay fair to, to both sides. And I think sometimes, actually, people want to hear what I call daily affirmation. They just want to hear their, their views uh, repeated back to them. And it's not something that, we're, that we do here. Um, but we try to make it TV friendly, something so that somebody who turns on the TV is watching the show can come away, as I said earlier, with an understanding of the subject and can, can well, say the next day, Hey, did you see what they did on Hardball? It's not the kind of thing you get anywhere else. Certainly, you don't get Chris anywhere else. Well, you guys are doing a great job, John, and we want to thank you for taking the time during the show today, talking to the folks here at the MSNBC Experience. My pleasure. I'm just sorry I couldn't be down there with you guys. Well, so are we. We're going to watch uh, Let Me Finish with Chris Matthews, and then everything changes, and we got Blueberry Pie coming in for the next hour. Right. Figure Excellent. that one out. Have fun. <laughs> All right. Thank you, John. All right. Bye. -bye. Twenty seconds. All right, all right. Yeah, Fifteen seconds. Seven 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 seconds. Seconds. Two. One. Touch black. Add his mic up.